so so Wes, we were we were saying that you know this is this is kind of like a I don't want to say best in class, but it's a really a, a really well built uh, you know permeability fil filter permeability for bikes and peds to get through. Um, but if we have to wait for the cities, Denver and all other cities to to build this level of concrete. It's going to take a while for that to get done. Talk a little bit about lighter, quicker, cheaper strategies. Is that is that going to be possible on on something like this? Yeah, I mean, if you think, what is this actually physically functioning like? It's mm -hmm. basically trying to keep cars from going straight across, mm -hmm. um, trying to give some permeability for bikes in the middle, pedestrians on the side. You don't have to have concrete curbs to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I've seen places do it with just they throw out these giant concrete planters in the middle of the street. I've seen them do it with almost mm -hmm. highway like barriers in the middle of the street. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cheaper things you could do. You could do it with flex posts. I mean, I wouldn't love that answer, but if we want to get a lot of these done quickly, I mean, that's a place to start. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about how expensive this is. Mm -hmm. It's a drop in the bucket compared to any highway interchange. Like, oh, now you're changing you, the right. subject. We could do a thousand. <laughs> like, so, I, I know we're sort of saying this is expensive yeah, and yeah, you yeah. need to do a cheaper version to do a lot of them. Right. But it also speaks to our priorities. We don't put enough money into this yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah. To, I, to I don't think it's really the money, right? It's really not the money. Right. What really what this is also representing is a tremendous number of hours of staff hours, of labor hours, of designing it, making sure that you can get it in and making sure that it fits the standards or you've got enough defensible uh, decision making in there. I mean, this probably, I'm going to guess, didn't go up fast. Well, compared to the traffic circles that I know right. up in a couple hours right. in the afternoon, like, this took a lot longer, for sure. Yeah. It not only did it take a lot longer, but it, the design of it took a lot longer design, too. Design, the engineering, yes, probably the community meetings, the, right. and then you know the time Ooh. takes. <laughs> you said the magic word, community meetings. Well, it's a it's a different thing when it's going to yeah. be a permanent installation like that. You have to do a lot more outreach and talk to the yeah. talk to the neighbors, talk to the community. Um, yeah. When you're doing something that you can say is temporary, we're testing yeah. this out. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, let's let's keep talking about community while we roll down this little street here. This is the Active Towns uh, channel, after all. We have to we have to be rolling while we're talking. All right. Uh, so yeah, so we're we're talking about community meetings, and yeah, we have to communicate with the the community. Um, they don't. They're not traffic people. They're not mobility people. They don't understand this stuff. But what they do understand is stuff is changing in their environment and. They get concerned and sometimes they get fearful and sometimes they latch on to misinformation. Especially Talk a little bit about the the challenge of, of you know. When you start talking about taking out a parking space, yeah. that's when people start to lose their mind a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. And sometimes rightfully so, like they have real concerns about that. I mean, a lot of it is overblown. But I mean, that's where you, you know, the being able to do something that you show is going to be iterative. That, yeah. Oh, let's test this first, see how it is, see what we learn, and see what happens with the things you're worried about. Um, like when Portland started doing their neighborhood bikeways, um, bike when they were called Bike Boulevards, mm -hmm. I think they changed them to Green Streets at some point. But yeah, I think you're right. They did a great job of measuring speeds, not just in the street where the Bike Boulevard was going in, but in all the parallel streets. Yeah. They were able to show, guess what? Um, traffic didn't increase in the parallel streets. Because it was those neighbors that were complaining about like Boulevard. So then when I went into the next one, um, it was an easier sell because they had that data to show like here's actually the, yeah. the outcomes we expect to see when we do this. And that brings up a really good point too, is that when we're dealing with the um, the community and you're 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 going through these experiments and you're going through these um, installations pilots you're trying to get some some information the what ghost bike oh ghost bike that's why we're doing all this yeah exactly some of it's the data but oftentimes community members are very very suspicious of data that's where that combination of having good data as well as good stories as well as good opportunities for them to actually touch it and feel it themselves really helps yeah you can't just go lean into one strategy and expect that you've got it done exactly. because if we lead with data 
and they'll just dismiss the data and say, yeah, no, I don't believe your data. <laughs> Especially in this day and age. <laughs> So now that we're away from federal, I didn't want to just completely dismiss federal and just say, oh, well, it's a straight street, so you know you can't do anything about it. But we were there, and yes, you could tell how much louder it was, it was higher speeds. They are challenges to deal with DOTs, but some DOTs are better to work with than others. And even within DOTs, uh, the district uh, division managers, etc. Some are, are are better to work with than others as well. Uh, talk a little bit about that from from your perspective and what you've seen studies and across the country in terms of dealing with DOTs. Okay. Um, so with this one, even when we cross the highway, like they had to work with the DOT to get that to get that part of it done. Yeah. And it's interesting, like. When you're here in it, you sort of look at things that the Colorado DOT are doing and you get frustrated and you wish they yeah. would do more. Yeah. But at the same time, you take a step back and you see what they're doing compared to other states and they're, they're so far ahead. Yeah. Um, so there's other people come and visit and see these sort of things like, oh my God, look what you guys are doing. Yeah. And compared to a lot of other North American cities, it, it's heading in the right direction. So right. I have to give them some credit for a lot of yeah. But, and then you still have roads like Federal that are still killing a lot of people, a lot of pedestrians, a lot of bicyclists, even though those pedestrian bicyclists are actively avoiding that street. It's right. It's humanly possible. Yeah, so this is another big strode. Okay, so this is an interesting little uh, niggle on, on this one here. So they used a little bit of paint right in the middle there. Yep. Again, Instead trying to... It in or pinching it out. Or yeah, yeah. And uh, just kind of creating some visual stimuli to try to slow things down. And honestly, you look straight down that street and with where that... Uh, motor vehicle driver is coming and that with somebody parked right there I, I have to believe that that person's not supposed to be parked right there that's got to be a no parking zone right there uh, seems like it should be based on the design that's got to be a no parking zone right there yeah, there, there there's the no parking at any time so uh but but in the end it still worked it, it was a very very effective traffic calming mechanism yep. for that yeah. motor and vehicle driver just a little bit of paint yeah well, and a, and, a, and a misplaced parked car. <laughs> and here's, if we swing this around, we've got some more paint and flex posts. We're gonna end up going right here, but I think yeah. there's a different kind of... Oh yeah, let's go check that out real quick. Yeah, let's go check that out. And then we'll come back and, and head down that way. And so again, on that nice long shot street that uh, we talked about, and I was like, ah, oh, we got to do something with the visual. This would work. Take a look at that. Yeah, there's some pink points. So that really helps, uh, you know, create that horizontal, you know, diversion. You're really creating a wiggle here. Uh, bastardized runner. Yeah. Or, uh, or as as my Dutch audience will has chastised me, Vunaf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying guys, I'm trying. But you can imagine, I guess you yeah. can wait and see a car come through, but yeah. that functions very differently than the other stuff yeah. we've seen on this trip, but it, uh... Yeah, let's, uh, let's do a U-turn and go down it. In fact, this Jeep, oh, we've got one coming, so... Coming yeah, perfect. Yeah. And yes, to the critics, yes, it's ugly. It's it, to me, it's just too 
it's too traffic signy, you know, it's too much of that aesthetic of, you know, it would be nicer if we could make things a little bit more attractive, but what this is, is a placeholder. You can put lighter, quicker, cheaper stuff in, put it in as a pl placeholder. That real estate is now reserved and And once that real estate is reserved and you've proven that you're able to slow traffic down and it's a safer environment, you can always come back and do the fancy stuff later. You can imagine planters, you can imagine seating, you can imagine a lot of different stuff. Right? Heck yeah. When I look at these guys here with the, the, the roundabouts too, the little traffic circles, the, the thing that makes me chuckle the most, Wes, is yeah let's put a tree in the middle of it we'll put a real a real street tree in i would love a street tree right there yeah whenever i do travel internationally which is rare but i you yeah. still see stuff like that where yeah trees are just planted right in between the park cars trees yeah. are planted in the middle of the street yeah um you just meander around them yeah well it's the whole point meander is the is the point we want to slow the traffic down to non-lethal speeds talk about the uh, Idaho stop here yeah so let's talk a little bit about uh, the Colorado safety stop so the ordinance uh, has passed and so uh, astute watchers of the video here uh, have noticed that we have been treating stop signs like yields technically we have to make sure that we yield to somebody who has priority yep. in that environment so um, someone might split a hair with us and say, well, you probably should have yielded to her on the right. Uh, but she I seemed pretty, was pretty close to the front. She, she, <laughs> she, she was pretty cool with us going through. Um, and then we can treat a stop light like a stop sign, uh, and proceed if it's safe to do so. We chose not to do so on a couple of stop lights so far, but we certainly could have. Yeah. Yeah. So anything else you'd like to say? And, and from a research perspective, uh, was that a good thing? Well, there hasn't been research on the effects here yet, but I nope. know when we've done Oh, but we've it, got decades and decades of data. <laughs> we the after, though. We the after. Like in Idaho, yeah. though, yeah. Um, they saw it actually made biking safer. Right. Like, you know yes. that as a bicyclist, I mean, this is sort of what a lot of people do anyways. I mean, this is right. a reasonable thing to do at a stop sign. They do right. very different perception on a bike than you do in a car um, now that that seemed like a really scientific word there uh, uh, professor uh, the reasonable thing well <laughs> we might have talked about this last time I was on your podcast yeah years ago I did the, the scoff law bicycling study where right we sort of asked we asked people sort of how they behave we gave them these pictures like here's an example you're at a red light there's nobody around like here's some things you could do and they told us mm -hmm. what they would do yeah um, the thing ended up going viral. We got 18,000 responses from around the world mm -hmm. in like a month. Right. 100% of those 18,000 people said that they break the law on a regular basis in the transportation network. Yeah. Most, especially the bicyclists, weren't sort of the reckless bike messenger you picture in like New York City. Right. They were reasonable people doing reasonable things. Right. That yeah. we all sort of do. I mean, just like yeah. we saw the street before, where the reasonable thing for a car driver to do in that street is to drive faster than the speed limit. Right. So they do right. so. Right. For bicyclists, the reasonable thing to do on at a lot of like full way stops is yeah. to, you know, if there's no cars around, you roll through it and keep going. Yep. Okay, we're going to turn spin around and take a look at some uh, other, other diverter, installations uh, here. So this is install one. So this is a quicker install. This is a little bit of a niggle on this. You can see how this got put in. You got a jog in the street too. You got a little jog in the street. And again, one of the real beauties of this type of facility is a significantly um, narrower street. Although when we look up the street here and on the left hand side, we can see just how wide that is right now. I'm not sure if, if parking is allowed 
uh, on that street. If if parking was allowed, that would actually traffic calm it a little bit. It is, but it's further down. Not, it's further down. Yeah, I think so. So, so there's some parking down to the left there. Right, right. There's some parking down to the left. And so re really what I'm talking about here, folks, if you look on the screen here and we look to the left, that's really wide. And that last vehicle that was coming through, he was taking this pretty fast compared to the, the first vehicle that we saw. Um, and part of it that I think is, is it's really, really wide there, and then it narrows down very abruptly to this one. This really one narrows this strip. Yes, and it does. And, it, and for the most part, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, but I would love to see additional narrowing up there. Yeah pulling in you know so that you can you know what if you're not going to go from the middle towards the curb then then do something to narrow it from the curb just to again make a little even more of a wiggle even more of a horizontal deflection because see where they're they're actually lining up is right along the park. pan because they had park yeah. cars there you force them left exactly then, yeah exactly yeah. So basically, they'd force left, force back right, yeah. force left again. So it'd be more. Of yeah. What we saw a little bit earlier. Yeah. But they were already in sort of where the park cars would be and making it straight through. Yeah. 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 But again, lighter, quicker, cheaper. Again, flex posts, uh, light materials. You've got your bolt down, rubberized uh, stoppers here. And, and voila, you know, this is probably, you know, arguably a couple months worth of design and running some models it's a and fraction of the time on effort yeah the other oh yeah compared, so, yeah compared compared to the, the other, other side when we're we're pouring concrete yeah because if we mess something up here it's easy to to yeah. pull them up take the take the paint off and re niggle and re rejigger it that's a technical term rejigger re it yeah yeah and i like this too you know we're, we're like traffic calming at that intersection traffic calming at this intersection now we're talking this is yeah. the type of well, if so you're gonna do like, this is one yeah things where it's really a network design they're yep. trying i mean it's not perfect but yep. they're a lot better than other examples yeah are you as part of what you're sort of keeping an eye on you'd mentioned that you know you're able to use denver as sort of your laboratory a little bit are you kind of keeping an eye on uh, how the communities are responding to these projects? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think whenever you, I mean, you can even tell let's, how things. Let's pull off in, in up this corner real quick here. Yeah. With the ballot box, like whenever we have anything, we give our money to sidewalks or to bike things. It passes by a wide margin in Denver. So, right. yes, there's people that are gonna complain. That's always mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. But um, I think the majority of people have sort of liked the like what they've seen. Yeah. Um, especially in terms of how it's functioned, I think people are enjoying it as opposed to just liking the design right. aspects. Painter so the reason I wanted us to stop here is to talk a little bit about this treatment here. So, um, talk us through this. Why why would why would this neighborhood want to well, paint a flower here? It goes back to community. Um, so what's the vision for these neighbors and? these buildings like what do they want for their schools for yeah. the people who live here and yeah to show that this isn't for cars 100 percent this is for people like this yeah. is something we can use as a community space um i'm sure a lot of these neighbors that have done this have done it in coincidence with mm -hmm. festival or right. closing down the street and having a big party here so it changes people's view of the street this might be school looks like an owl that we're looking at here so maybe mm -hmm. this has connection to their mascot right. um, so it's nice it's great I mean I yeah. think a lot of people think that this shouldn't be in the street but why not yeah well, what are the reasons people think that because it's not in our guidebooks because mm -hmm. there's no MUTCD kind of mm -hmm. criteria for mm -hmm. building a mural in the middle of your street um, that sounds like the, those people it sounds like you're talking about the engineer yes yes the yeah because the, yeah. the the normal people the don't normal even know people don't the, the mind they don't yeah yeah. Now, yeah people like public art right i think for the most part yeah um whether it's on a mural on the side of a building or in the middle of the street mm -hmm. you can get a similar effect yeah yeah what do you think of it this is a little bit older one but 
I think streets are for people. <laughs> and this just gives a little bit of an inkling of that, doesn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, that's the whole reason I wanted to stop here, is to, to reflect on the, pa the fact that what... And, and look, we've been standing here in the middle of the street now for, you know, two, three minutes, and we haven't seen a single moving car. Unfortunately, we haven't seen any walk, anybody walking or biking either. Um, Today's but, also the hottest day of the year. In and, and, and it's a hot day, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but what we're talking about here is creating an environment um, for all ages and abilities. We see some improvements here with uh, ADA ramps finally going into these areas. You can tell finally because you can see that that's new concrete that got poured there. And so that's, that's very, very helpful. But when you have these traffic calm streets, in addition to having high quality sidewalks, then you can have the ability for uh, the kids and, and adults and elderly to be able to ride bikes, you know, through a neighborhood bikeway like this. Um, it's a complement to the protected and separated infrastructure that is out there that encourages uh, active mobility. Um, and so it's not either or, it's not one's better than the other. It's, it's got to be, yes, this and yep. the others. And here we're connecting a school. Yeah. We're yeah. at Sloan's Lake yep. at the other end, and any kid that lives along this entire stretch mm -hmm. can get to this school, can get to that lake. Yep. Um, and we can, like you said, stand here in the middle of the street. I'm not worried about a car yeah. coming. And even if a car yeah. did, I'm not jumping out of the way. Like They're yeah. going to be going slow enough. By the time they get here, yep. uh, we can meander out of the way. Right, we can meander out of the way, and we, we see that it is a 25 mile per hour zone through here, uh, the end of the school zone, so that means that uh, in, in the school itself is probably 20 miles per hour or 15 miles per hour. I think I'd push that school zone another block. Probably, yeah, so I way. would too, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, even even the design of this street, looking down it, you'll notice with uh, uh, the proliferation of parked cars on either side, it does narrow this space. And so it really does help with the traffic calming, too. Yeah. So, I mean, we like to we like to pick on uh, cars and parked cars and things of that nature. And, and, and we're both good friends with, you know, Don Shoup and the high cost of free parking. Um, but parking can also serve our purposes in, in residential areas like this uh, when it can help with the traffic calming. Yeah, in one of my first yeah. research studies, we looked at, um, it was called reimagining on-street parking. Like, mm -hmm. What are actually the benefits? Because yeah. for decades, traffic engineers want to just get rid of it like, yeah. for the sake of more capacity and more speed. Right. Yeah. Um, and they always told me, like when I was a consultant, we'd, you know, we'd be working in maybe these smaller New England town centers and it would be sort of a state highway coming through and think, oh, we can't possibly put on-street parking on this yeah. because it's not safe. Yeah. I was like, well, what do you mean? Like, why? You do the research and it, it slows cars down. It is safer. Right. On lower speed streets, less than 35 miles an hour, it's safer. Right. Yeah. And since we've already established that yeah. the entire you know city needs to be like 20 miles per hour anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we don't yeah. want on-street parking. Look at that. So we actually are sending a bus down that street. That's interesting. Sending a bus down. Is it still a bikeway? I think it is. Interesting. Although I'm surprised we didn't have a four to stop the last Definitely feels a little different. Yeah. I didn't see a, a, a neighborhood bikeway sign back there. I think we probably lost the neighborhood it's bikeway. Back with the flat trail, so that's where yeah. we're going next. Yeah. And we've got some uh, businesses here, including a really cool looking bike shop there. Nice. Nice. So, so what do you think of a street like what we're on right now, where we're sharing the space 
with a bus. As a bicyclist, uh, from what perspective are you thinking that? Yeah, you can, whatever perspective you want to chime in on. So, I mean, as a bicyclist, it, it is hard to share spaces with the buses. Mm -hmm. um, Why? They're very big, they're very heavy. If they hit you, they're gonna win. <laughs> So and the and the one we're what the one we're lingering trying to stay back from uh, is also diesel, so it's stinky too. It's stinky. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's one of the neighbors back with yeah. that direction. So in, in in terms of the transit, I, Denver's done a better job of separating them. So with those bu the bus lanes you saw downtown, they have sort of the floating bus stops now where the bike lanes sort of to the right of the bus stop. Right, yeah. Those have helped quite a bit, because in the early days when I moved here in 09, a lot of times you were sharing the space with a you know, bus lane or things like that, and uh, it was never all that comfortable. You'd rather be sort of somewhere else. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think for me, it's it's this the sheer mass of just how, you know, massive these buses are, yeah. and then you're expected to share space with them one of my most enduring memories of visiting um, and riding on the infrastructure in Minneapolis was on a bus bike lane shared and I kept playing leapfrog with the bus but you know what I mean you're playing leapfrog oh, yeah. with yeah. a bus in that environment and I'm like no guys and this actually kind of um, brought up a, a thought in my mind when I was remembering that experience was that the way I fixed it was I just went one block over. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute, this one block over is a delightful, quiet, leafy residential street with low traffic volumes. And I was like, that was a huge epiphany for me, is that oftentimes our bike network is put on these busy streets that are wider, that have the space, and in that case, and you're also sharing space with bus, but uh, one block over was a delight. Now, so, so Wes, we're on this particular facility and it's, it's basically a facility to nowhere, but it's a brand new building. So they leverage that development to get this shared use path built. And uh, yeah. But it's one of the things that cities have to do is they have to be on top of development so that they can, you know, get stuff built, you know, in that incremental block where they're at. Yeah. And for some reason they're like, yeah, do a really wide shared use path there. And probably because this is on a future bikeway designation, they're like, let's make it, make sure that we've got it in. Yeah. And that helps because I've seen, was it Davis where they bought a house and tore it down so they could connect the bike path? Yeah, yeah. So you, want, you don't want to get in a situation where you're doing that very often. No, 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 so not at all. Like but when you head in this way. Yeah, and leveraging and, leveraging. and and you'll notice that, or I noticed that there was uh, other facilities there. There was a little doggy <laughs> bag <laughs> area there, you know, so clearly there's some intentionality for the, for that facility, even though at the moment we were like, okay, where's this going? Seemingly nowhere. Here it is. Signs, downtown, point seven. We saw that we're 1.7 from Union Station, where I'll catch my bus back to Boulder. 
it's amazing to see how much housing now is in all of this area compared to when I worked here in the 90s. Yeah, that was that was a nice little connection there. It uh, it really, you know, kind of drives home for you just how loud cars are. <laughs> now we're a little bit further away, and so it's not as bad. But yeah, uh, it, yeah. even though it's a nice off-road, safe connection, yeah, it's not that pleasant. Like you don't right. Yeah. Like, between the noise and the air pollution, like it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, compare that to hearing the river noises. Yeah. It's a different environment. Yeah, exactly. You know, the facility might look exactly the same as cell. Yeah. The context matters. Yeah, for sure. So now that it is a little quieter, uh, Wes, uh, anything that you're working on currently? Anything you're super excited about? Uh, Any trends? Big thing is my book coming out early next year. Oh, about what? Road safety. Yeah? What's the title? Or working title? The working title is Killed by a Traffic Engineer. Okay. About how we see you're uh, you're you're getting uh, rather uh, edgy. <laughs> you're going for the juggler. Uh, you'll see. Uh, it's fun, right? I, I, so this month I'm finish, finishing up the uh, the edits on it. Okay. The Who's edit. the publisher? Island Press. Nice, fantastic. So it'll be, uh, it's on their spring 24 schedule. So okay, like, very um, good. So I've been working day and night the last few weeks trying to get those final changes out the door and get it to a manageable length. Yep. Yeah. For people to read. I mean, the, the basic premise is that you know, for a thousand years, you could argue that doctors killed more people than they saved. Right. Traffic engineering is only 100 years old, and we're still in that stage. Right. Traffic engineers like me, it's easy for us to make you think like it's also scientific. Um, but in reality, I dug through a lot of really old manuals and papers sort of figure out what traffic engineers were thinking at the time a lot of our standards and guidelines were put together right and you see that back then they admitted that they didn't really know what they were doing like we're going to test this you just got to come back and try figure out the safety stuff later and we never did yeah we like over time things that were temporary somehow get hardened where they become stronger because we forget the limitations at the beginning right and that's sort of what happened like i don't think even traffic engineers you know for the most part they're not trying to pull the wool over your eyes a lot of them don't know how little it's all based on right so it's a lot of really fun stuff like that to show yeah yeah that it's not as scientific as we think yeah 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 and you know and you know even in uh, confessions of a recovering engineer you know chuck had a, a fair amount of empathy for you know engineers that in the sense that you know they didn't they don't necessarily mean to <laughs> despite the title like I exactly agree, yeah. yeah i'm sure you <laughs> have a little bit of that subtlety as well yeah no honestly they yeah. don't know any better like, yeah we've not taught them that right for the most part, they've taken yeah. one, maybe two classes in transportation yeah. at math, at most, yeah. unless they yeah. get a master's or PhD. Right, yeah. But at the same time, and I will uh, adjust my camera here for this, um, but at the same time, traffic engineers, yeah, yeah, you don't get any more of a pass. We know now. <laughs> it is a certain amount of cognitive you know, disconnect and not really um, appreciating 
the the fact that we do know what needs to be done. Well, and if you read my and, book, I'll give you the ammunition to effectively argue with an engineer. Yeah. So when they tell yeah. you all this stuff, yeah. You know, this engineer speak, it's scientific. Yeah. It's hard to argue with it when they tell you there's a warrant for something. It's hard to know what really that means. Right. Right. And how, where you can push back and where you can't. Yeah. And there's a lot of places we could and should be pushing back more than we do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's the biggie. That's the book. That's the book. All the right. On, so. Nice. Well, you know what has to happen. What's that? Um, you have to come back on the podcast uh, to uh, to launch the book. So, that's I think awesome. that's I think that's actually in the contract, <laughs> contract. with uh, Island Press. I think that. Uh, yeah, they're wondering yeah. why I'm not on social media. I was like, well. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them, uh, I'll you talk know, to John on, on his podcast. Yeah, t- tell <laughs> tell Jamie um, and tell Heather that uh, you and I talked and we, uh, we 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 shot this, and that you will be on the podcast. Thank you so much for today and taking me yeah, around. Yeah, I, I had a great time. It's always fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, anything that we didn't address that you really think is important to to, to kind of leave everybody with? There's a hundred things we hadn't yeah, addressed, John. Yeah. But I think, we got the podcast. We'll we'll do yeah, that no, later. We, we but, saw, yeah. I think we saw a good example of a city that's moving in the right direction. It's not yeah. perfect, but they're using a lot of different tools to try to build a network for, yeah. for bicyclists that's safe, that can something that kids can use, that older people can use, not just people that me, they don't really yeah. mind the traffic. Yeah. Um, and it's it's so much better than it was. So yeah. Yeah. you gotta give them some credit. Yeah. It's awesome. Wes, thank you so much. Thanks, I, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, look forward to having you back on. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this on the bike interview with Professor Wes Marshall from the University of Colorado at Denver. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, (laughs) leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, uh, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just be sure to click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.